Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. Let me say welcome to everyone who's joining us online, our Northwest campus, Cal State campus, even those in the courtyard. Come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. This is a special Sunday at Discovery Church, a little bit different flow for everyone as well that's joining us online or even our campuses today. You're going to be with me a little bit longer because today is Commitment Sunday, so the flow of the service is going to look a little bit unique. We're actually going to go back into worship again towards the end of the service, and we'll have a time of reflection, a time of prayer, a time of commitment. For those of you who have been on this journey with us, this is the fifth installment, the last installment of a series that we called Unstoppable. Uh, For those that are new to Discovery, I really believe that you're coming at the best time, to be honest, because you're going to see Discovery at its best. You really are. This is an amazing church. Is, we, are, we are people that have been rescued from the darkness and the despair and the depression. We are people who have come out of the pain and the past and who are not just recipients of the grace and the goodness of God, but want to be conduits of the grace and the goodness of God. So what you're going to see today is the church respond in radical generosity and faith so that other people would know the grace and the goodness of God. So I'm glad that you're here. But today, what we've been doing for the last five weeks, we've been talking about this vision called Unstoppable in the series called Unstoppable. But five Sundays ago, we actually uh, uh, launched this new vision Uh, on the same name, Unstoppable. The reason why it came, like where it came from, you guys, because this has been an amazing story. Discovery's journey has been miraculous and powerful and one that we've just knocked down barrier after barrier, wall after wall, and seen so many people come to Christ and be discipled and mobilized in their purpose and families restored and physical healings and things like this, amazing things that we've seen God do in in our 10 years. But now we're at a place where where there is literally, like, where do we go from here? Because we've outgrown the space that we just bought, this building. We bought it just a few years ago, and, and, and we got to this place where we honestly wrestled with the tension of, maybe this is good enough. I'm just honest with you guys. Maybe we're good here, and we can just kind of settle in, dig in, and, and just kind of perfect what we're doing, status quo. And y'all know me, man. I got, no, I got one gear. It's forward and fast, you know what I mean? So that came for a little bit, but then I was like, no, I just felt the Spirit of the Lord tell me I'm not done. I'm not done. And, he, and I believe that he's not done. So this, this unstoppable vision was birthed out of that. God started speaking fresh vision and revelation into us about what's next. We honestly believe that our greatest days are ahead of us. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. So this vision includes three focuses of unstoppable. The unstoppable church, the unstoppable mission, and Unstoppable Faith, which is all of our expansion projects. We're building a new worship center here at Southwest location and looking for locations, physical locations in North and East Bakersfield, uh, Mexico and Uganda and beyond. You guys, the vision is bigger than any one person, but we know that together we can change the world. And so this is, and just to, to clarify too, it's not like we're, we got, okay, church fund, mission fund, expansion fund, all outreach fund, all these funds. We have one, we're moving towards one fund, one goal. Like, like we don't have multiple visions. We have one vision. So when you look on the tithe envelope in the future, you're not going to see like, oh, here's to the expansion. Here's to the building project. Here's the Mexico. Here's the, you're not going to see that. You're going to see one line item for unstoppable. We're going to, because, because we have one vision. We don't have two visions. We have one vision here to lead people to love God, find freedom, love each other, and change the world. In fact, our kids and our youth here at Discovery, they have the same vision that we have just at their level. In fact, this last week, they were on this unstoppable journey. They've been studying and growing through that what it means to live an unstoppable life and serve an unstoppable God at their level. And so last week, they actually turned in their commitment cards of what it means for them. What is God calling them to do to be unstoppable, the kids' ministry and the youth ministry did. And we actually recorded some of their testimonies and stories. So check this video out real quick, guys. My commitment to Unstoppable is to help others give to people who don't have anything and to invite people to church and to pray for people. The church is going to be like more different locations so like people can go to Discovery more because this is the best church I've gone to. I have a wallet and um, and I'm going to put my money in here and then in 
and then I'm gonna save it in my room and the next time I go to church, I'm gonna give it to you guys. My commitment to Unstoppable is to, to give something that I love to someone else that needs it more than me. I love everybody at Discovery. Everybody's so nice, and I'm excited to see how the church is gonna be when it's all done and stuff. I feel like there'll be a lot of more people coming, and I'm really excited for that. You know, it's 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 always good to give because it goes to the church, strengthens your faith in, in God and Jesus. You just feel you just feel like so much better throughout your day, knowing that you gave that you gave back to your church and to God. It's not really just you're giving money to the church, it's you're supporting the church and just supporting what it's doing and the lives it's changing and the lives that are going to Jesus. What I learned about giving is that it can have a huge impact on the church as just a whole, not just like the little parts of it. It gives back to the community. I, what I've learned through Unstoppable Giving is you just have to give everything to God. Um, a lot of the times we find ourselves giving in certain areas and in others we don't. And I just think through this uh, Unstoppable, we've learned that you have to give it everything in every way. I'm excited for the challenge. I think this is gonna be a good challenge for me, a good start, because um, I think Unstoppable to me, I feel like like nothing else can get in the way. Like, especially like, just the word Unstoppable just means like, you can't, you, you can't like be stopped from reaching something, especially like with God, like my relationship with God, and like what's in between, it can't be stopped. Like it's unstoppable, you can't stop it. I think for what I've learned through Unstoppable about giving, I think it's, I've learned to give give some of my finances up. Like what Pastor Jason said, this is a relay. So we can't just focus on what is affecting us like right now, but we also have to think about the future. We can't change what happened before, but we can change what's gonna be in the future. You know, I mean, I have a lot of friends and buddies that, you know, don't really come to Discovery and I'm hoping like with this movement, you know, and obviously with prayer, that eventually more people would come and not just people from my school, but the whole community and that they'll just see something different here. Come on, aren't you proud of these kids and our youth? So awesome. So here we are today in this final installment. Um, this title of the message today is called Unstoppable Generosity. Towards the end of the service, we'll have an opportunity ourselves as well, like our kids and youth, um, have shown us to give our commitment. Um, like I said, if you're a guest here today, don't feel obligated to do anything. You just sit back and, and, and watch the church be the church today. So in, in preparation for um, this message, Unstoppable Generosity, I actually study, like I usually do, I go and, and cover a lot of the scriptures of what God has to say about the topic and the subject. And it actually took me to a few chapters of the Bible that um, speak extensively on generosity in Second Chronicle or Second Corinthians chapter 8. In verse 9, and so I, I studied, I actually read those chapters in, in Greek and, and kind of word for word read every word and what it meant and kind of did a deep dive study. And I want to show you like my results of my study today and just kind of like a higher view. I'm not going to Greek you. I'm not going to anything like that, you guys. I'm just going to, I'll show you what I learned from it. But as I was studying about generosity, as I was studying about making a difference, even last week, if you missed last week, I, I taught a message called um, Unstoppable Legacy. And I think it would be a very important, especially if you're a parent here today, young people, wherever you're at, watch that message about Unstoppable Legacy. But even in preparation for that and reading about legacy, I actually discovered that there is a primary motivation, the primary motivation that God gives us in his word to actually live this way, to make a difference with our life, to be generous, to serve people, to love people, to, to leave a legacy. The primary motivation in the scripture for all things compassion and making a difference, you know what it is? It's heaven. Heaven is the primary reason that the Bible gives, that Jesus speaks about all throughout the scripture, the primary reason why you should make a difference, why you should serve, why we should give, why we should share our faith with our coworkers is because heaven is real. It is real. This earth is temporary and heaven is where it's real. And so is hell, by the way. Heaven and hell are a reality. And that's the primary motivation for making a difference with our life, giving, serving, sharing our, our faith. Last week, 
I was coming to church with my daughter. We were driving together, and she was telling me how um, one of her friends, it was actually that day where like, she, she said she just got off the phone with one of her friends from, from school that was going through a tough time and was literally telling her how he, he felt like he didn't have any purpose, any meaning, didn't, didn't even know what it was all for, and he would just want to stop school, want to stop everything. And he was just kind of pouring out his heart to her. And, and, and Grace goes, and I knew this was a moment for me to share my faith with him. And so she started sharing and telling me, like I started telling him, like, that's because you were created for a greater purpose than what you're living for. God designed you. God created you. And until you connect to the creator, you're never going to. And she's like preaching to me in the car. I'm like, that's my girl. That's, oh, I'm so, so proud of her. And I told her that, I said, I'm so proud of you, Grace, for being brave and, and not being like, like shy about it, but also being gracious, loving him well, not like pointing the finger, but loving him well and showing, sharing the truth and the hope that you have. And she said, she said Dad, I have to. I'm, I look out for those moments where the Holy Spirit opens a door. She said it was years ago, long time ago. She didn't even know who and doesn't know exactly when, but she heard a story. Someone told a story, their story, to Grace, my oldest daughter. And the story was when this, this, this person was in high school, they were a Christian, had been a Christian for most of their life following Jesus. And they would share their faith and invite people to their youth group constantly. But this person said there was one person in high school that they would never invite and actually did not want to come to their church, did not want them to come to, because they were just a mean person, like a bully, mean person jerk of a person. Like, I don't really want them in, in the kingdom, in the same kingdom. He can just, so, so this is just the, okay, they're a teenager, you know what I mean? So he's like, this is, i oh, nah, nah, he don't, he don't get to come, okay? Everyone else and this mean person doesn't. Well, obviously that's not the right heart of God, okay? He's a teenager, okay? But he gets older and he's serving God. And, and this person who was mean kid in high school sees his social media that he's like active in faith and active in church and serving and stuff. And he, he, he comments to him and messages him on social media and says, oh, how long have you been following Jesus now? I didn't know you were a Christian. And he's like, oh, this is that same dude. There was, a, there was a jerk in high school. So he looks at his profile before he replies. He's like, is he still... Who, who, and so he's, he sees that he's got his life changed, man. He's going to church. He's serving God. He's active in his, his faith. So he replies back, and he's like, yeah, actually, I've known Jesus since I was in elementary, and my, my family raised me this way, and I just, I, I've been serving God for a while. I'm glad to see you, too. And he said, he, he, he said, what? He put like a question mark, exclamation mark, and he said this. He said, how come you didn't tell me back then? I needed Jesus in my life. I needed him then. How come you didn't tell me? And Grace said this story has stuck with her so much because it was almost the opposite of what I've taught my kids to, to seek after their master Jesus saying those words, well done, good and faithful. And she said, dad, I remember, like, like that's like the opposite of the well done. That would, like, you didn't tell me? How come you didn't tell me? She said, it's pierced my heart and every, like I, every moment I get, I'm sharing my faith with people. I was studying for last week, I was studying for Legacy that legacy sermon that I preached last week. And in, in my stage of life that I am right now and in the stage of just our church and our ministry and what God is doing, I'm thinking more about legacy than I ever have. Um, and I'm studying for it. I'm preparing for it. And, and I, I remember um, the night before this conversation with my daughter, you know, I was just being thankful for everything God has done. I was just rehearsing the gratitude. And I started thinking about my legacy. And I started thinking about my kids. And I started thinking about you. I started thinking about your kids and your kids. And then I thought, like, you know what? I, I only have about 20 to 25 years left in the role that I'm in right now. In this role that I am right now, I got about 20 or 25 years left before I have to pass the baton to the next generation. Okay? That's, that's just a, a, a reality. And for some of you, when I say 20 years or 25 years, for some of you, you're like, oh, a long time. But others of you, you know, that's a blink. A lot of you know how quick that, that goes. 20, 25 years in this role as the lead pastor and visionary leader of this church. And then I'll step into the final stage of my life. I hope the most impactful stage of my life, of which some of you are in that stage of your life. And then after that stage, I get to see Jesus. I get to stand before my King, my Savior, my Lord, and I pray I will hear him say, 
Well done, Jason. You, you did good. With, you were faithful in the little that I gave you. I gave the resources, the time, and the talents you gave. You were faithful in the little I gave you. Come on and enjoy your master's happiness. I pray I, this reality, listen to me, church, please hear me. This reality that you will stand before Jesus that heaven is real. It changes. This hope that we have changes everything about life. It changes the way you live. It changes your perspective on earth. It changes how you deal with problems and trials and challenges and droughts and seasons and relationships. It changes everything when you know heaven is real. It's where I'm going. It's where I will end up one day. And so it makes sense. That, that Jesus and, and the Bible and the writers of the New Testament would, would use this as, as a primary motivator, heaven and eternity for all things compassion and making a difference, that, that this would be it. And all throughout the scripture, I could give you so many, I'm going to give you a few today, of, 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 of the motivation of heaven being what you're aiming for. Be, let that be your motivation. Store up treasures there, not here. First Timothy chapter 6 says it like this, command those who are rich in this present world. How many of you rich people up in here? Anyone rich up in here? Nah, come on, no one raises their hand for that. You know what I mean? I ain't rich, and if I am, I wouldn't raise their hand. Here's the, let, me give you the, let me give you the definition of rich. Rich is this. It's having more than you need. Having more than you need. See, the reality is, especially here in America, no one thinks they're rich because there's always someone who has more than us. But the reality is, you are rich. Every single one of us has more than we need. So the Apostle Paul says, hey, command those people who have more than they need and are always wanting more, not satisfied with what they have. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So God doesn't mind you enjoying your stuff, but he says, that's not all it's for. Command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. And then he comes back to the point that I'm talking about today. In this way, you will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Once you realize that that's the age, heaven is the age that, that your whole life is about. Then he says, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So I'm gonna tell you why today you should, you should direct more of your time, of your energy, of your focus, of your talents, of your resources, of your breath, like you should, we as children of God should be focusing a whole lot more in heaven, not on earth. Let me give you a few reasons why the Bible tells us. Number one is this, because heaven, not earth, is my home. For every child of God that's in here today, we need to realize this, this is not my home. I don't live here, I'm just passing through. I'm passing through. Like one of the healthiest things that you can have is this reality that your home is in heaven. In fact, in, in John chapter 14, write it down because I didn't put it in your notes or anything, but in John chapter 14, the disciples come to Jesus and they're depressed and they're discouraged and they're looking for encouragement or help from Jesus. And in John chapter 14, I believe it's verse six, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. That's how he begins. They bring him a problem. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And you would think that Jesus would pray for them or help them or encourage them or do a miracle for them. Okay, you're depressed, discouraged, only help you guys out. But he doesn't. He says, don't let your hearts be discouraged and depressed. I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many rooms. Okay, so they bring him an earthly problem and Jesus gives them a heavenly solution. This happened all throughout, I'm telling you all throughout the gospels, people would bring Jesus, earthly problems, and he would just try to shift their focus, especially his disciples. He goes, stop focusing there. I'm going to prepare a place for you that you may be where I am as well. I know it can be discouraging here. This is earth, but get your eyes off earth. I'm going here to prepare a place for you, which is why the apostle Paul could even say from prison in Philippians chapter three, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. And look what it says. Their God is their stomach, meaning their enjoyment, their pleasure. Now look, there's nothing wrong with enjoying, but he says, that's become your God. It's become your focus. You're worshiping enjoyment. You worship pleasure. 
and their glory is in their shame. Now watch this. I'm telling you why they're enemies of the cross right here. Look, because their mind is on what? Is on earthly things. But then he goes, no, 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 but not us. Our citizenship is in, say it out loud, it's in, it's in heaven. That's where we belong. That's our home. We're citizens of, he says, as we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so why should we be unstoppable? Why do we not quit? Why persevere? Why keep going? Why share our faith? Why give? Why make a difference and leave a legacy? Why live generously? Because heaven, not earth, is our home. Here's another reason the Bible gives us, because the line is longer than the dot. Write that down. I actually got that from Randy Alcorn's book called The Treasure Principle. It's a really small book. If you want to read about this topic in, in, in detail, it's a really great book, real small. It's called The Treasure Principle. In, in that book, he says, he says, we're all focused on the dot, but we should be living for the line. Okay, the dot, and I have a dot up here in a line, like, a, like an example up here, but that dot represents your life. It's like the, the speck, it's the moment. And we're so focused on that. It is small and finite a breath, a vapor, a mist, but every one of us are headed for the line. We're headed for eternity that is long and infinite, okay? So it just, it just stands to reason then, if we're all headed for that, we shouldn't be as focused on the small, finite moment that is earth. We should actually be a lot more focused and interested in, in the long, infinite reality that is heaven. We should be focused on the line, not the, the dot, which is why the Bible commends people who live their life this way, who live the life of faith, seeing things that were not as though they were beyond their life. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, we call it the hall of faith chapter. These are people who saw things that were not as though they were. And a lot of the people that were mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, a lot of them did not get to realize the fruit of their faith. They didn't get the miracle. They didn't get the promise. They were just told it. They were living ahead of their time. And the Bible says this about those people in Hebrews chapter 11. People who live this way make it plain that they are looking for their true home. All of them had their focus on another life, on another home, not just fixing up this one. I'm sending treasures ahead of me. Watch this. They were after a far, say that word out loud, everybody, a far better. I'm going to time out right there and just kind of like the reason why a lot of us don't really like the topic of eternity, maybe even the topic of heaven too much, is because, listen to me, you've convinced yourself that earth is better than heaven. Somewhere in there, you've convinced yourself that you need to soak it up, live it up, do it while you can, because you're going to be a fat baby with a harp and wings in heaven and singing in a choir the rest of your life or something like that. You got the wrong picture of heaven. You got to get the right picture of heaven if you're going to start, start investing in your life. You got to get the right viewpoint. Heaven is Better, the Bible says. A better country, heaven country. You can see why God was so proud of them and has a city waiting for those people who live that way. So what are we gonna do, you guys? We're gonna re redirect our life towards eternity. We're gonna redirect more of our time, our resources, our energy towards the line, not the dot. Write this one down. Why should we live this way? Why should we live generously? Because there's limited time and incredible opportunity. I love this one because... Everyone on earth has limited time. And we all realize this. Last week, I, I read you the psalm that says, teach us to number our days, that it's just a breath, it's a mist and a vapor. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. It's, it's just quick, you guys. We have, everyone on earth has limited time, but check this out, listen. Not everybody has incredible opportunity. Not everybody has the same opportunity. I think that those of us here in the United States of America have an incredible opportunity that the rest of the world doesn't have. We have an amazing opportunity. We're so entitled. <laughs> I'm going to get off on the wrong track. Okay, let me just say, we, we, we have incredible opportunity here in this country, you guys, more than others. We are blessed. Thank God. Thank God. But I think those of us here at Discovery, we have not just limited time, but I think this church, hey, Discovery Church, can I speak to everyone who calls Discovery home? We have incredible opportunity that the movement that we see God doing, the souls that are being saved, the power, the anointing, the favor, the grace, oh my goodness, not only do we have limited time, but we see the incredible opportunity that is right before us. So what do we do? We should live generously. That's what we should do. We should live for heaven, not for earth. So I told you I was, I prepared, in my preparation, I found 
2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, and I read like all the Greek and studying and all that stuff, and I kind of, I want to share with you what I found from it, but I want to read a portion of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and then we're going to dive in deep. In, in 2 Corinthians, for those of you that they may not be familiar with your New Testament, the Apostle Paul would write a whole bunch of letters to these churches that he would plant. He'd plant them, raise up leaders, raise up governance, and he would leave and go do it again somewhere else. And so he was like a church planter apostle, would raise, plant churches and raise up leadership and keep doing that. Then what he would do is he would write letters to the churches to encourage them, to give them doctrine, to correct them. And in this instance that we're going to read, he's actually reminding them of an offering, of, of, of a generous act that he wanted them to do, asked them to do, and he's reminding them to do. It was an offering to go towards Jerusalem, which was their like mothership. It was where everything began. The Jerusalem church was the beginning church. It was the original church, and, and there was, they were in need. And so he's like, he already told them before in this first letter that there was going to be an offering that he wanted to receive from them. And now he's reminding them, and he's going to give us some principles of generosity that I think are so important. If we're going to live today with what I'm calling with unstoppable generosity, not living for earth experience, but living for heaven reality. Can I get an amen, somebody? Okay, let me, let me read some of it for you. I'm not going to be able to read all of eight, chapter eight and chapter nine, but I'm going to read some of it. Second Corinthians chapter eight, starting verse one. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about, I love the words, the language here, the grace that God has given this different church, the Macedonian church. So he's, he's, com he's kind of comparing He's doing a healthy competition here is what he's doing with the Corinthian church. He's going, look, the Macedonian church, they, they did pretty good. I want you to know how good they did. He's, he's creating a healthy comparison, but I want you to know the, the language that he's using. He says, I want you to know about not the amount, not the offering. He said, I want you to know about the grace on them, that they had something in them that actually wanted to do it. Look what it says. In the midst of a very severe trial, watch the language, their overflowing joy in their extreme poverty, welled up like they couldn't even help themselves. It was just, it just welled up from with, like in, in, in extreme generosity, rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. So no one had to help them. No one had to like tell them to or twist their arm to. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectation. Paul's just bragging on this other church. Watch this. He says, they gave, not just money. Look what it says. They gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God to all these people. But then he goes, but hey, Cor Corinthian church, you guys are great too. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, See that you also excel in this, not the amount of giving, but in the grace of giving. I want you to enjoy it like the Macedonian church enjoyed it. Guys, I want you to enjoy this, and I'm not commanding you. I love the language in this. So you don't have to. He's like, I'm not commanding you. And by the way, you don't have to. No one's commanding you to be generous. No one's commanding you to make a difference with your life. No one's going to command you to leave a legacy. He's like, look, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he gave it all. He became poor. So that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to give. Notice all the motivation here. It's not about ob obligation. It's the motivation, a sincere motivation. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Then he says this, for if the willingness is there, like if you'll find the fun, find the joy, find the inner desire in it, that's what makes the gift acceptable to God. Not if we do it grudgingly, not if it's bitter, not if it's like during it. No, no, no. The only gift that's acceptable to God is the willing gift, according to what he has, not according to what he does not have. I wish I could read all of eight and all of nine, but let me give you a few words that pop out all over these two chapters about living generously. And really, there are five choices 
that you and I need to make, if this is going to be a reality, if we're going to live with heaven in sight, eternity in sight, live our life to make a difference and choose generosity, then we're going to have to make five different choices, okay? Here they are. Number one, choose to give joyfully, okay? Like if you haven't found the fun in it, then you haven't found the Spirit of God in it yet, okay? If it's not fun, if it's not enjoyable, then you're missing the Spirit of generosity. It said they had overflowing joy. Like it was the byproduct of what God was doing inside their heart and inside their life. They didn't have to force to do it. No, no. It was just the outcome, the overflowed outcome of their joy and their love for God. We have these cards that I like to, every year I kind of remind you guys of these acts of kindness cards. And I like to remind you guys during the, the holiday season, this is a little bit early, but these are in every lobby at every, at every location of Discovery Church. They just basically say something extra to show you God's love you. A lot of you use it more than in the holiday season. Uh, I like to keep some on me in my wallet. And as I'm led by God to pay for something for someone, whether it's in a drive through or at the grocery store or, or at the gas station or just leave a tip and drop a card with it. You guys, if you haven't found the joy in giving, then I want to encourage you, grab in, in the lobby at, at the welcome centers or in the lobby, Grab one of these acts of kindness cards and just see if it doesn't put a smile on your face, just blessing somebody, okay? Choose, look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. Choose, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. You know what the Greek word for cheerful is? Hilarious. <laughs> like God loves like the giver who finds the joy in it, right? Who just like, who's laughing, who enjoys to bless. Uh, that's what God loves, that hilarious, joyful giver. Choose to give Joyfully, that's what we need to do. The second choice that we need to make is choose to give selflessly. Selflessly. I think we're so self-focused, self-consumed. Our needs, our desires, our interests, our wants. Really, it's not even our needs. We have a lot of our wants, our desires that cloud out a kingdom-focused mind, a generous life. We need to make this choice if we're going to live with unstoppable generosity. we got to choose to live and give selflessly. I love this quote by John Bonnell. He said, if one gives himself to the Lord, all other giving is easy. Isn't that true, you guys? Like once I've surrendered my entire life to God, giving has become so easy. It used to be hard before I gave. I couldn't understand why people would serve and give and do all that with their time and their money. I couldn't understand. But when Jesus got a hold of my life, it was easy. Now, all that I have is his all that I have, I don't own anything. It's easy to serve. It's easy to give once God owns it all. That's why Second Corinthians, Jesus himself, you guys, he, this is what he did. This, he saw a sin problem, and he didn't send somebody else, right? He sent himself. He said, I'll go pay for it. He didn't just give. He gave himself. So I'm not just giving money. I'm not just giving a commitment card. I'm giving myself to the Lord, right? That's why 2 Corinthians 9 15 says, Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. I can't even describe this amazing gift that we receive that we do not deserve it. That's why, you know, people out in the parking lot, the parking team, they're helping park cars. You guys, they're not just helping park cars, they're not just dream teamers, they're giving them themselves to the Lord. The kid, the, the team in Discovery Kids right now. They're not just like writing checks and stuff. They're, they're giving themselves to the Lord. This is a choice that we have to make to choose to give, not just joyfully, but the Bible tells us to give selflessly. Here's number three. This third word that comes out is choose to give willingly. I love this. So it's not that you're doing it because you have to. He says, if the willingness is there, then and only then the gift is acceptable. So I always like to say, give what's in your heart to give. Because, you know, there comes a time in the service, every time towards the end of the service, and we'll do it today towards the end of everything, we're going to worship God with our giving. And I'll say, hey, let's, at this time, we're going to worship God with our tithes and with our offering. And, and there'll always be a few people, though, that get triggered by that. Oh, now you're putting that on me. I'll hear this, something like this. Isn't, isn't tithing an Old Testament law? I'll hear that sometimes, that question. Wait a second. You talk about the tithe there. There's just, isn't that an Old Testament law? Yes, absolutely it is. And by the way, you don't have to obey it. It's a law. You're under grace. But just because it's, it's the law does not mean that God took away the principle. The principle is still there, you guys. So, so God doesn't write 
commandments on tablets of stone. The Bible says he's written them on the tablets of our hearts. So it's not I do it because I have to do it. There's a lot to do it. I do it because I'm overflowing from within. Something within me overflows. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So no longer is it like, because of the law, I'm fulfilling it by doing it on the inside of your heart. I came to change the motivation for your giving. Okay? So what do we do? We give willingly. Number four, we also need to choose to give intentionally. Intentionally. That's putting some thought into it. The intentionality, right? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about what I'm giving. Be intentional with the generosity. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 7 says it like this. You must, each, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. That's the hard thing. I'm not telling you how much. They're not, don't let anyone tell you how much. You must decide in your heart what to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to sad puppies on a video. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Don't let anyone manipulate you into... into, into, into no, 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 you, you need to hear from God. Which, like, hey, I, I try to, like, stir you to, to live generously and to think about heaven and to think about legacy and to think about making a difference, but I'm not telling you what to give and how much to give. Don't let no one tell you what to give and how much to give. That's God. God wants to be the one to move your heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11 says, you will be made rich in every way. When you live this way, he says, I'll make you rich more than you need in every way, not just financially, so you have more joy than you actually need. More time than you actually need. God says, I'll multiply it. I'll just make you in every way that you sow. I'll make you rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and your generosity will result in people thanking God. So what do we intentionally give? There's five things you can intentionally give, or four, rather, four things. Intentionally, write this down. We need to intentionally give our time. Our dream team, they have something called worship one, serve one. So they come and worship a service and they stick around and they serve another service. That's worship to God. Okay, serving God. In the, I saw someone um, a couple weeks ago cleaning up spilt coffee, one of our dream team members in the lobby, smiling while they were doing it. Okay, no, I got this, Pastor Jake. It's going to be cleaned up before anyone, anyone gets here. That is worship to God. Just as much as lifting your hands and singing in here is worship. Them taking care of the babies right now is worship to God. Intentionally give our time. Number two, we, we can intentionally give our talent. The Bible says each one of us, a grace has been given, meaning that word is a divine enablement. Some of you are good with organization. You're good with with speaking, you're good with kids, you're good with different assets, whatever those talents that God has given you, you can intentionally give that to God and serve others. We can intentionally give our touch. And this one's free. You can pull out your phone right now and send somebody an encouraging text. Hey, bro, thinking about you, praying for you today. You can give someone a smile. You can give someone your, your hug. That's free. Intentionally give your touch. And then lastly, intentionally give my treasure, my my time, my talent, my touch, my treasure. You can give your life, your tithes, your offerings for use of the glory of God. The next verse in verse 10, it says that now he who supplies seed to the sower. So who does God give stuff to? Does he give it to everybody? Nope. God has a lot and he doesn't give it to everybody. He supplies seed to the who? That's who God gives to the people who are actually sowing seed. And bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. So God has it all, and he isn't giving it to everybody. He's watching what you do with what you got. And then he's going, oh, you're going to do that with it? Okay, I'll give you more seeds so you can continue to do that with it and do it even more. That's what he's doing. That's what the Bible is saying. So what do you do? We be intentional with our gift. He says, you will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. Okay, the fifth word, the fifth word. I know I'm going quick because we've got a few things to do today, but choose to give thankfully. The Bible says this is, should be our posture of, of giving. We should give with gratitude. I thought about this Psalm, Psalm 116 verse 12 says, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? Let me answer that question for you. You can't. You can't. How can we repay all the goodness, the life that he gave, the stripes on his back, the the, the death that he, how can you, you cannot repay for the goodness of God. And the result of that should be an enormous gratitude in our heart. 
let, let, me, let me close this, this with this thought. Because in Exodus chapter 13, there's, a, there's, the, there's a, a, something that Israelites would celebrate called the Passover. Some of you know what the Passover is, but it's, it's the death angel that passed over their house and spared them while they're in slavery in Egypt. But, but God was giving some, um, some teaching to the Israelites, to the next generation. He says, there's going to come a time where your kids, your son's going to come to you and say, why do you do that? Like, why, why, do you, why do you do that, dad? Look what it says. In the days to come, your sons are going to ask you, what does this mean? So wh- wh- why, why do you serve, dad? They're going to ask you, why do, you, why do we stay longer than everybody else? Why do we, why do we got to stay for another service? Why did you give to that homeless person? Why, why, did you, why, did you, why do we give? Why do you serve? Why do you make a difference? Why? why? There's going to come a time where the next generation is not going to know. And they're going to ask you, why? What does this mean? And he says, say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord has brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In other words, he said, pull the back of your shirt back and show them the scars of your slavery. Show them that you were once in darkness, that you were once in despair, and God rescued you out of that situation, saved you, and set you free. And he says, that's why I make this. That's why, son, that's why. Because he gave everything for me. Because he didn't leave me alone. Because he healed me, and he restored me, and he saved me. That's why I serve, son. That's why we give, my daughter. That's why we live this way, not for this earth. That's why we look, because the line is longer than this dot, son. That's why, that's why. That's why we sacrifice. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.